think I'm, I'm not saying I'll be that, but that recipe may begin with everyone expecting a congressman. Wait now. <laughs> A fill-in, wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> on his way here, Brian stopped and saw some guy walking on the side of the street, asked if he wanted to talk, he said no, and that was me. <laughs> and um, so I, I think if there's a recipe to the worst speaker, this, this is a good start. Um, so uh, uh, Brian had, you know, basically said, do whatever you want, and, and probably the easiest thing for me to do is... Uh, um, a couple uh, short, brief stories here. Uh, I am doing an event, uh, I'm performing at Old Castle tomorrow night. There's a, an event uh, there um, that I don't know much about. It's some sort of variety event that I was invited to, to do, and uh, if somebody's gonna hand me a microphone, I don't ask any questions. I say, <laughs> okay, yeah, sure, I'll be there. Um, so anyways, uh, I, uh, I, I was gonna tell a story that I might tell here. I don't do, I don't, rehearse or map out or write down any of the stories I do. I, I know them, I lived them, so I mean, I was there for them, so I, I know them, but I don't, I don't usually practice them, but at the same time, sometimes it's nice to go through it once, so I actually uh, know what I'm going to kind of framework of what I'm gonna say. So, you know, in that sense, uh, you'll, you'll help me out for a minute with this. It's, it's not, not too terribly long, so. Um, so uh, the theme, this variety event is called All in the Family. It's some sort of family-related theme, so I was asked to kind of produce something that would kind of fit into that. And, um, and so I got thinking about my parents a little bit, and um, most of you in the room are parents. Many of you have had parents, and uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think you get that age when you're a kid where it's like your parents, you love them, they're great, but you kind of hit that point where, I mean, your parents aren't cool or all that interesting or, uh, you know, they're, they're not, they're, they're a little embarrassing, they're a little <laughs> dorky, you love them, but they're parents, you know, that's, that's pretty much it. And I think growing up, that's the way I viewed my parents. And uh, it's, it's only as an adult sometimes that you can look back in hindsight and go, actually, you know, my parents might have been really kind of interesting people, kind of maybe even on the, maybe kind of groovy far out. I mean, you know, raised in the 60s and, uh, you know, a little bit of product of the time. And uh, looking in hindsight, I look at things that I thought were normal as a kid and I look back and go, that was kind of actually interesting. So. Um, my father had a best friend in high school named Kevin. And uh, Kevin and my father managed to cement uh, their friendship for life uh, by marrying sisters. Uh, so uh, they uh, got out of high school and uh, my father married my mother and Kevin married my Aunt Beth. And, uh, and because uh, uh, they were best friends and sisters, uh, as young couples, they spent a lot of time together. They would visit each other frequently. They'd go on vacations together. And, uh, and this particular story came from one of those vacations where they were on Nantucket. They did this a couple years in a row. They went out to Nantucket and got a, uh, a house out there on the beach. And uh, my, my uncle and my father were walking along the beach in Nantucket and they came across, now I, I will pause for a minute and say my stories are true. All the stories I tell are 100% true. I'm going to get to a point where I have to be honest the truth gets a little fuzzy for a moment, and it's not my fault, it's my father and my uncle, because I've heard 30 <laughs> different versions of this moment. I don't believe any of them. So I'm not necessarily believing this one that's about to come out, but I will say this is the one moment it gets fuzzy. My father most recently said that my father and, and my uncle saw something white shining in the water, and they waded into the water and they're up to their knees, and they reached down, and their hands fell upon the object at the same time, and light shone from out of the water, and they pulled to shore. I don't believe by any of that, but anyways, now I'll return to the, to the facts of the matter, which is they pulled to shore this big moss-covered thing that they can't even figure out what it is at first, but they start scraping it off, and what they have found is the vertebrae to a whale. And from looking into it afterwards, it, this was probably the largest vertebrae on a particularly large whale. They had this bone that was about this big around. 
and they they hauled it in. It was the neatest thing they ever they had ever seen. They bring it back to the cabin. As it turns out, it smells like an entire ocean and 20 tons of death. So they spend the rest of the vacation scraping stuff off of it and bleaching it and scrubbing it. And by the end of the vacation, they end up with this white, beautiful, giant whale bone. It was like nothing they'd ever seen. And uh, they, uh, the, the vacation ended and they realized they had this problem, which is there was one bone and two of them. So they devised a plan by which they would meet twice a year and exchange the bone in what went on to be known as Bone Weekend. And Bone <laughs> Weekend started small and it just was, it started kind of casually, but each year it grew and became more intricate and advanced and complex. There were photo shoots and bone salutes and handshakes. My father and my uncle gave speeches. There was a bone stamp. There was a t-shirt that my mother designed that had a, 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 a drawing she had made of the bone. And beneath it, it said, bone power. And uh, I used to wear that t-shirt to high school. Um, and my teachers all looked at it like it was vaguely inappropriate. <laughs> but they couldn't quite put their finger on what, what it was they were looking at. And, um, and, 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 and I think the culmination, maybe, the, 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 what it hit its peak was that there was this movie and uh, I always get this wrong. What, what were the old films without sound like eight millimeter? Uh, somebody must. Yeah, they 16, were eight. 16, 16, 16 millimeter. So there's a 16 millimeter movie that was shot in which my parents uh, play parents, and I'm a baby, and I play a baby, and my <laughs> uncle is dressed in black with a, a knit hat and, and a long beard, and he plays uh, like a. a a cat burglar from Woodstock, and um, the story goes that the, the movie progresses that the, the baby thief steals this baby, um, who is later in the movie rescued by the bone. And the final clip of this movie is, uh, is me all bundled up in a, in a sled um, with a rope going to the bone, and the bone's wearing a cape, and, and it's pulling me off to safety. And, uh, and I thought this was all normal growing up. Like, I mean, none of this phased me whatsoever. Friends would be at my house, and my father would be casually talking on the phone, referring to somebody as the bone brother, and this was all normal. And, uh, you know, I, I think as I look back on it, you know, I, I think the, the one thing that, uh, that I, I kind of came to take from it is that my parents passed on a sense of fun and wonder and excitement in silly everyday things, even just a bone, mm -hmm. even the bone. <laughs> <laughs> bone power. Entire <laughs> room packed. They had a hall and wow. chairs from from uh, the next room over. You wouldn't believe the, the group that they get. And uh, this, the theme for that night was change. And because I, I like to be contrary, uh, everyone else did about life-changing events, and I did mine about loose change. So anyways, uh, that, that story was um, that, uh, you know, listen, uh, I do these story events, but I was just like a storyteller. You, you just, I mean, Brian's a storyteller. He did one over his happy dollar. I mean, this is just, uh, you know, many of us are storytellers, uh, you know, around uh, the dinner table with our family. Um, so when I was growing up, you know, I, I was always telling stories and, and talking and had these, you know, stories I'd keep retelling. And, and I used to kind of do this thing that I thought was fun. I used to say, you know, there's that one story for everyone that, like, crystallizes who they are. That uh, you can tell that one story and it says everything you need to know about that person. And, yeah, I mean, it's a gimmick. It's like, obviously that's not true. You can't get all the complexity of a person in one story, but it's kind of fun. And there is something to it that every now and then there's a story that's like just, so it, yeah, that like gets, it just nails it. So uh, for everyone that was close to me, my family and friends, I, I had that. I had, I called it my one story. I've got my one story for every person that I could tell. That's the story that will tell you everything you need, need to know about that person. You know, um, 
I, you know, is uh, for my mother, who was one of the smartest people I ever met, and so well read, but sometimes kind of shy. I, I used to tell this story about how she, when she went to to Albany State, uh, the, she was uh, the only class she was excited for was the equestrian class, and on the first day of school, she 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 got to Albany State. She doesn't know. She's like, where are their stables? She drove all over campus looking for stables. Class after class, she would just show up and drive around looking for stables. She never found them, never rode a horse. And, and I like, this is the one story. For my brother, I used to tell the one story. We went to college. I was a senior. He was a freshman. We went to the same college. And, uh, and he w uh, came down and visited a friend of mine. And he was complaining he didn't have time to go to uh, the... Uh, um, uh, a dining hall for breakfast. He was going to be starving. And my friend said, I got a bowl. I got cereal. I got milk. Uh, run up to your room and grab a spoon. So my brother runs up to his room, runs back down. Oh, we open the door and my brother is standing there and empty handed. He'd run upstairs, come down and completely forgot what he went up there for. <laughs> as soon as he looks at his hands, he goes, oh my gosh. He runs back upstairs. He runs back downstairs. We open the door again. This time he's staring there with a toothbrush in his hand. He looks down and he goes, oh my God. So for my wife, my one story for my wife is that um, uh, in, in North Carolina on a vacation, uh, uh, she got uh, chatting. We were at a, uh, uh, at a pub and there was music and dancing. And she gets chatting with a, with a guy, a real nice guy. And she says, come on, let's go dancing. She drags him out on the dance floor. Um, and uh, uh, she, she comes back afterwards after a couple awkward minutes of dancing. And, um, and, and I said, well, that... That was very brave of you, Sarah, to do that. And, and she goes, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, you, you brought a man with one leg on the dance floor. <laughs> and she said, he had one leg? Um, <laughs> true, true story. So, uh, but for my father, I guarantee if he was here right now, he would tell you, he, he could guess what this, the one story was. But uh, my father's one story uh, is... is about the nickel roll. So uh, when I was a kid, there was always a uh, change played a big part of my life. Uh, probably partly because when I was a kid, we were broke. So, you know, it was definitely a phase in life where it was like going through seat cushions when we needed milk. Um, but on top of that, the bigger reason is the miss money. My father was in a bowling league. And uh, they, just for fun, one of the things they did is if somebody missed a spare, they had to throw a certain amount, 10 cents, a quarter into this, this jar. And, um, and, and then at the end of the year, they would use the missed money for their banquet to buy drinks. So just something they did for fun. My father, as one of the organized members, was in charge of maintaining and keeping the missed money. So throughout the season, this big jar in our house would start filling up with change. And in time, my family began to see the missed money as our own in-house bank. So now, to be clear, we ne my father never took, I mean, he, he was very, he was almost ashamed when he had to borrow money. So we always repaid everything, but at the same time, we'd be broke, time to put a dollar of gas in the car, in goes an IOU to the missed money, out comes a dollar, and, and, and then, you know, by the end of the season, uh, there would be this mad dash to refill the miss money because my father would be stressing out. He's got to replenish because he's been borrowing from it all season long. And, uh, you know, it, it seemed very normal to me as a kid. That, like, I just pictured every family had something called the miss money that you could just go to when you needed a few extra bucks. So my father was always rolling change because of the miss money. And uh, one particular day, I, I was probably 14 or 15 years old, and uh, my father's rolling change, and he says, uh, Mike, uh, I, I left a nickel roll on my desk downstairs. Can you run down and get it? So I, I say, yeah, sure. So I, I go downstairs and I get to his roll top desk and, and he's got some papers and stuff. And I'm looking around and I, I don't see it. And I shout out, I said, dad, I, I, don't, I don't see it. He says, come on, it's down there. And so I'm looking around I'm like, I, I don't. And I, he, I can hear he's getting a little irritated. He's like, do I have to come down there? And I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm like, I don't see it. So my father starts coming downstairs, and I can hear him grumbling the whole way down. He's not coming down. I can't find this thing. And he gets down, and he gets to, to the desk, and darned if he doesn't reach right into the middle of the desk and pick up that nickel roll sitting right there. And he didn't even say anything. He just kind of looks at me and goes, <laughs> and upstairs he goes. 
And uh, you know, okay, I felt like a real dolt, you know, what can I say? But uh, so that, that was that. Except two years later, now that's an important detail in this story. It says a lot about my father. Not a week, not a day, not a month. Approximately two years later, sitting around with my dad. I don't even remember what we're doing, but my father starts to chuckle a little bit. Then he busts into a full laugh. He starts leaning back, looking real pleased with himself. I'm like, all right, okay, you got me. What is it? I can tell you, you want me to ask, what's going what? And uh, he says, do you remember a couple years ago how I sent you down to find a nickel roll and you couldn't find it? And I went down and it was right there. And I'd say, yeah, I'd say, yeah a little random, but I, uh, I remember that. My father says, well, I was walking downstairs when I remembered that nickel roll was in my shirt pocket. <laughs> says, I got down to the bottom of the stairs, I stepped between you and the desk, I dropped it in the middle of the desk, and then picked it right up. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, you, for two yeah, I mean, like, he waited two years, two years. I mean, the, he would, I, I think the only reason he eventually told me is he wanted to gloat about it. Otherwise, <laughs> he would have not even told me. Two years, he hung on to this. And I, I said to him, Dad, for two years, I thought I was just an idiot. My father said, this doesn't necessarily mean you're not. <laughs>